All right, if you got your Bible, if you would turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Um, if you are joining us for the first time, we've been walking through this book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, honestly, we started it August 25th, and we've gone, it's, it's, if my math is correct, I looked at this, I think today is my 31st sermon uh, going through this. We took a few breaks for holidays and some other specific things throughout the year. Um, but this is kind of a weird deal for me. I, I, I do this all the time. Um, at the end of a series, there's a little bit of sadness, but there's a little bit of excitement about what's next because uh, my, my heart and my mind, I've been, I've been in this book and studying it and learning. I've learned so much. I hope that you have as well. Um, but it's just kind of a, a weird weird place uh, of, of closing out a series, but I'm excited about what's to come, and we'll talk about that in the next, uh, in the next week or so. Um, but today, we're going to kind of wrap this whole thing up, if you will. Uh, we're not going through the whole chapter. We're going to look at a specific couple of verses in here. Um, but if you remember this idea of, of what's going on in Corinth, just to wrap, just to kind of frame it out, if you will, in case you're joining us for the first time online, uh, Corinth was a church that had lots of issues. We've been detailing them as we've gone through all of this. Uh, Paul planted this church. He loved this church, and he's in Ephesus, and he gets word that this church, the wheels have just fallen off, and everything's just kind of going crazy. Um, so what he does is he writes a letter. He writes a couple, but this is the, the first letter that he writes to them. And he's addressing specific things in specific five categories. Talked about divisions, sexual ethic, practices and freedoms, worship gatherings, and then what we've just been talking about for the last month, this idea of the resurrection uh, and what it means for us and how we long for the day when Jesus is going to come back. Uh, and so he's got to establish these, these um, fundamental truths or issues that are going on in their church. Um, and so it... It's, there's kind of a weird deal because chapter 15 is kind of the climax of the whole chapter. And to be honest with you, it looks kind of, um, it, it feels like chapter 15 would be just a great place to stop. But just like anything else, when you write letters, like this this didn't originally have chapters and verses and subtitles. It was written in a letter. And so just like any other letter that you would write or I would write to somebody if you actually wrote it out, um, as you get done talking about things, you kind of have a salutation. You kind of wrap things up. You kind of tie things back up. A uh, little few reminders, if you will. And so that's what Paul's kind of doing. In this 16th chapter, it's broken down to several sections. Basically, the first, um, he's going to ad address with him at the very first. You can read it if you want. But he's going to talk about taking up a collection and supporting the church in, uh, in, in Jerusalem. Uh, being fi they're talking about being good financial stewards. He's reminding of that. The next section in the, in the chapter... He's talking about uh, discussing his own ministry, about how he abounds in the work of the Lord and, and those kind of things. Uh, and then today, basically, you know, what we're going to look at specifically in this is, is verses 13 and 14. Um, he's going to lay down some very specific and essential imperatives for us uh, and for them uh, to, to live with and to, to, to embrace that kind of summarize everything we've been talking about. And then you can read on if you want from 15 to the end. He basically closes with talking about different personalities and people that are important and uh, as a part of the church. Um, but for today, uh, we're going to look, honestly, at two verses, uh, 13 and 14 uh, in chapter 16. So I hope that you'll grab your Bible, um, underline that, highlight. I'm going to be all over the place with different scriptures. Uh, Brock's been fantastic. He's going to have the verses on the screen. Um, if I have one at the end, I want you to turn to it probably later, but just, just, just stay with us. Uh, stay in 1 Corinthians 16 as home base, and then everything else will be on the screen um, as we move forward. But let's, let's read our text. It's very short, um, but I'm looking forward to what God's going to do today. So let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 13 to 14, then I'll pray and we'll go through it. Paul says this, Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for uh, today. And I thank you for the privilege of, of getting to preach your word. I thank you for the privilege to speak uh, on your behalf. And I pray, Lord, that even though we have a short text today, that there is so much to this. I pray that we would uh, be mindful. I pray that our hearts would be open. I pray that the spirit would move. And though we're not together physically, that through technology and through the internet, God, that we as a people, we would be unified and that your spirit would move in us wherever we are right now. Uh, God, we are the church. We don't have to meet in a building though we long to, but we can be the church this very morning. Uh, help us to unify under your word and under the banner of Jesus and to make much of you today. So thank you for that. Help me to, to speak your word and to speak truth. Uh, and I pray that everything we do is honoring to you. 
And I ask it in your name. Amen. Well, um, I, I chose uh, the title for today is going to be called this. It's called In the Meantime. Um, and the reason I came up with that or I kind of landed there was basically we've, we've talked about these five issues in the church. We've been talking about the resurrection as kind of the climax of the whole book. And then it's, it's kind of a, oh, by the way, I'm going to remind you of some stuff. Because in the meantime, until we either die or until Jesus comes back, Paul's going to say, this is how you need to live. Their, their, their life goes on. We need to live in the faith. We need to be, uh, be uh, laboring, as we talk about laboring for the gospel, laboring for, for, for Jesus. Um, and so in the meantime, here's how we're supposed to do this. And, and, and right now, you're probably thinking, hey, this is two verses. This is going to be the shortest sermon ever. Um, it'll be, maybe, I don't know. Um, but I want you to see there's a lot of truth here. and There's a lot of, there's a lot of weighty issues here. Um, and so we're just going to walk back through this. And, and, and so I want to jump right into verse 13. Um, and, and I need you to see this right up front. Everything. I'm going to give you five things from this. There's five truths, five things. Brock's going to have them on the screen. I want you to write these five out. Everything is going to go back to these five things. And if you wanted to, you could actually look. Every one of these five things that we're going to talk about from these two verses is basically a summary that if the Corinthians would have applied this and lived this out, they wouldn't have fallen into the temptation or struggles in the first place. So it's a, it's a, it's a referral back to the book and saying, this is how you're supposed to live. Think, think of this. If you'd have done this, then you could avoid all of those issues. Um, so it's very, very important. So the very first thing that we need to see that Paul gives us these imperative commands, um, and I need you to hear that in the original language, these are not optional. This is not... Um, uh, as I studied this, this is not kind of a, if you feel like it, uh, scholars agree that these are imperative commands. They are statements that are general corrections about previous errors, like I said. So the first thing he says, this is the first one, is that we're to be alert. Um, in, in some translations say this, say to watch out or be aware. And it breaks down in different, different, different translations. Um, one, one commentator put this way, and I love this. It says that the Christian life must be a life of alertness. We've got to be awake. We've got to be alert. We have to have our sense acute to understanding what's going on, to evaluate and to be aware of what the adversary is doing. You can't live the Christian life, is what Paul's saying here, in a state of stupor. You've got to be alert. And if you think about this, if you go back to the whole book, we've talked about this, this is an issue for Corinth, and arguably this could be an issue for, for Olten or, or for churches in general, for Christians in our day. Because the honest truth is, is they were not alert. They were not uh, being watchful of what's going on there, but that's why in chapter 1 and 11, they had divisions and conflict. Chapter 3, they had a lot of pride issues. In chapter 5, they had a lot of sin that they were just letting creep into the church. Chapter 14, they had chaos and disorder in their relationships, and it was just uh, and in their, in their gatherings, uh, their worship services. And then in chapter 15, they had some really bad theology that was just, just all creeping into their church. And it just it destroyed them and it caused all these issues. They were not alert. They were not watching out for dangers that were out there to be creeping in. It's not a joke. It's not something that we have to, to just to casually look at. Uh, I love, uh, basically, I love how, how, how 1 Peter 5, 8 says, notice the language, be alert, be watchful, and sober, of sober mind, excuse me. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, I said a while ago, this is not a joke. This is not a casual approach. We live in a world, a physical world, but we also live in a spiritual world where there is warfare, spiritual decisions. There are spiritual battles taking place every day. And Paul and what Peter is saying is that every second, every minute, every moment, we've got to be on the lookout. It is not always the obvious where Satan wants to, 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 to hit us. He wants to, he's not always going to hit us with the obvious. He's a deceiver. He's a schemer. He's going to try to creep into our church, to our faith, to our relationships, to everything that we do to try to dismantle or destroy or, or, or just kind of cause us to get futile in our faith. He's going to try to do everything he can. Um, we've got to be aware of what's going on around us. We've got to know his schemes, know what he's doing. Um, now, many of you know this. Uh, uh, many, 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 many years ago, I, I coached for about two years. I coached up in Amarillo. Uh, I coached in junior high, and I did some stuff like that. Um, but one of my many jobs as a first-time coach in, at the junior high 
uh, if you're a coach out there, you'll, you'll appreciate this. Part of my job was I was to go out and I was to scout for the varsity football team. I was supposed to go out and scout games, and I would go, when our team would go play here, I would go to some other game and scout the team we're about to play next. And part of my job was I was to script out plays, I was to write out their tendencies, and I was supposed to come back to our coach and to our team with my, my, my other assistant coach or the helper. Um, uh, and basically, we're supposed to come back and say, hey, here's what we found out. Here's what they run. Here's their tendencies. Here's the plays they like to run. Here's the, 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 the you know, we scripted all these plays out. Here's their favorite plays. Here's their top three plays. Here's their best player. Here's what they're best going to hit. And so my job was to report and do that. And I think that that same idea applies to this when we look at this idea of what Paul's saying of being alert and aware of what the adversary, the enemy, wants to do to us. Now, look, this will be on the screen, but I, I love this. I'm about to give you one verse that's going to show you, here, it's going to show you the, the tendencies of Satan as he wants to come at us and hit us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. And so what I want you to hear this is that these, this is where Satan's going to hit us with this tendencies of the world, these tendencies of what Satan's going to tempt us with. In his scouting report, if you will, I know it kind of sounds silly, but his scouting report of these, this is where he's going to hit us. These, these are the plays he likes to run. This is what we got to be ready for. And, and all of these issues, this physical desire, it's a longing after things other than God. Anything that wants to creep in that you think, I'm not satisfied with God, I want these other things, a more. And a lust of the eyes is craving stuff. We have a desires of the flesh, we have lust of the eyes, being captivated by outward or other things. And this pride of life, this boasting about what we have or what we do, and this, this pride issue, and make no mistake about it, all of those, hear this, all of those destroy Corinth, every one of them. Now, I need you to hear this this morning because if we are not alert, if we are not aware of what is spiritually taken on around us, we are going to find ourselves discontent with God and giving ourselves to other things. Even in this moment of a, of, of a pandemic and we're, we're in, in, in social distancing and all these kind of things, we're finding ourselves in this new area. But if we're not careful, even though our calendars have been stripped, we can slowly begin to give ourselves to other things. And so I just want to give you that little scouting report that when Paul says we got to be alert, be watchful, like, a, like, like, like I'm scouting for the team, here is what Satan's going to do. He's going to try to hit you with uh, desires of the flesh. He's going to hit you with the lust of the eyes, being captivated, and he's going he's to try to entice you to be proud and boastful and kind of not dependent but independent from God and the way you live. That's dangerous. And so that's why Paul is not just casually saying, hey, here, if you feel like it. He's saying, guys, be alert. Be watchful. Whoa, listen. Do this. Listen, this is what's going to happen. Be alert. Look out for evil. Look out for temptation. Don't just assume that things are fine, but they may not be. I, I reflected back on this before I get to the next one. I reflected back to when Jesus, uh, actually Revelation chapter 3, this, when, when there was seven churches in the book of Revelation, one of them was the church in Sardis, and it, was, it had, a, had a reputation for being alive, but it was spiritually dead. But listen to the language here in Revelation chapter 3 as Jesus is speaking to the churches. He rebuked them for the same issue. Look at this. Revelation 3, verses 2 and 3. Wake up! Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and what you have heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you don't wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what time I will come to you. Jesus is shaking this church up and, and basically saying, strengthen what remains, because you have a re reputation for being alive, but you're about to die. Wake up. Be alert. Hold fast to what you know to be true. Repent. Get it together. And so when I say all that, I use Sardis as an example, and we go back to Satan's tendencies in 1 John chapter 2, and this scouting report of being alert. I need you to hear this this morning because I pray that, that mine and yours, that our hearts will be alert and aware, spiritually speaking, of what temptations and struggles and what our hearts begin to fall for other things. That we've got to, as Paul says, we've got to be watchful and be alert for anything that's going to come across and draw us away from the Father. So that's the first thing. Number two, as we keep going, Paul says, 
stand firm or stand fast in the faith. It says, stay true to what you believe. And it's, it's one thing to be alert and to be watchful, watchful, excuse me. But when something else strikes against what you believe, when there's temptation that does come, when Satan does hit you with some sort of temptation or struggle or, or enticement, we have to stand firm. Now, Paul hammered these guys um, back in chapter 15, verses 1 through, 1 through 2, when he says, Brothers and sisters, I need to remind you of this gospel that I preach to you which you have received and which you have now taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to what I've preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. And he's, he's telling these guys, hold on to what I've taught you. Hold on to what you've been preached at. Hold on to, to the truth that you, that you believe because if you don't, otherwise it's all in vain. It's pointless. Um, there are things in the world that would like to come against what we believe as followers of Jesus. I think of Colossians chapter 2 when Paul was writing to the church in Colossae. Um, and it's, one of, it's, 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 a, it's a text that I love uh, about standing firm, um, being diligent, staying true to what we believe. And uh, when those things come across, listen to what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. So then, just as you've received Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith of as you were taught. Sound familiar? And overflowing with thankfulness. Hear this. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Jesus. Did you, did you see what he's doing here? He's, he's addressing the same issue to the church in Colossae. You stand firm. He says, let your roots go deep. You need to be strengthened in the faith that you were taught. And he's saying the same thing. Hold fast to what you believe to be true because there are other things in the world that are going to come crashing and try to entice you to pull you away. I, I, I love this because he, he's, he's saying don't be swayed. Stand strong in your convictions. Um, and I always tell people that, 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 that this truth of the gospel, it's, it's, it's affirmed in the Bible, that we can test everything against it. That we don't have to go out and try to try to learn every false teaching and all these things of the world. If we understand the truth, if we understand the gospel, if we understand God's word, we can understand that we filter everything through that. And anything that would come across that or go against what God's word and his spirit would tell us, we can say that is not of the Lord. And so it's, it's just, a, it's just a, um, as I, I think it's a very simple way to approach all the false teachings and all the things that are out there in a way to stand firm. Um, I know it's this time of year, and, and, and I, like many of you know this, I was a youth pastor for nine years, and uh, it, senior graduation things are coming up, and, and we're praying for you guys. I know there's a lot of chaos, a lot of craziness going on right now. Uh, but this scripture in Colossians, honestly, was one of my go-to verses when talking to seniors and preparing for a new chapter, a new life of going out there, of just wanting to encourage them to continue to live, continue to hold on to what you've been taught. Be rooted and built in Jesus. Let your roots go down deep. Be strengthened in the faith as you've been talking and teaching about. And overflowing with gratitude. And this idea of verse 8, see to it. <laughs> like a parent to a child or a loved one to somebody they care about. As they go out into the world, see to it that nothing takes you captive. And that captive term is a military term. Like a prisoner being drug off. See to it that nobody takes you prisoner. Nobody takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies. Now, there's a lot of things out there that would go against what God's word tells us that we would maybe even sound a little bit true, but they're not. But they're hollow and they're deceptive. And they depend on human tradition rather than Jesus Christ. And so the challenge for all of us, seniors, uh, adults, children, everybody, that we stand firm in the faith and, 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 and understand that we can stay true to what we believe, grounded in the word of God, true in the Holy Spirit, in, in our relationship with him. So Paul says, number one, be aware. Number two, stand firm. And the third thing, I hope you're writing this stuff down. He says, be courageous. Uh, it may it, your scripture or translation may say, act like men or be men of courage. Um, but here, hear this. It's, it's one thing to be aware. And it's another thing to stand firm in your convictions. But Paul is saying, hey, it's time to grow up. Time to mature, time to be firm in convictions and be courageous because there are decisions and things in life that are going to come against what you believe and it's not going to always be easy. Um, 
it, it's, it's a difficult thing. He's, he, he's, he's pleading with them to be mature. And a mature person tends to be courageous. A child tends to be rather fearful. A mature person tends to have, we should, self-control and confidence. And that's essentially what Paul's saying. You guys, be courageous. Grow up. Mature. Conduct yourselves, as you're, you may say, in a manly, but it applies to everybody, in a manly or a womanly or in a godly way. He says, conduct yourself in a way that is courageous, that is mature. And you might think back, if, if not, uh, just think back with me, chapter 3, back as we're referring back to the text here, when, in, in verses 1 through 3, when Paul says, Brothers and sisters, uh, I, I cannot address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. He says, You're mere infants in Jesus. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you're not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not still worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? And what he's getting at, and remember I said all of these points go back to the whole book. Um, he says, you're, you're immature. And that's part of why you had issues and why you can't really have relationships. And you bicker and you fight and you divide and you start choosing sides and you pit people against other people. You complain about things and, and you want to talk bad about somebody else and you want to create divisions and camps and this and that. And Paul's saying, well, that's got to stop. You've got to be people of courage and maturity and to grow up in what you believe. They were divided. They were taking people to court. You may remember this. They were fighting. They were choosing sides, like I said. And he's done with it. He says, that's kind of when the wheels began to fall. Uh, he said, you got to be courageous, mature. And it's powerful here. I love, I love what Psalm 27 verse 1 says. I just want to throw this out there. Psalm 27 verse 1 says that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now that not only is amazing for us to be courageous, but that Psalm 27 is a great transition to point number four. That we are to be courageous. We are to well, be alert, to stand firm, to be courageous. But also we are number four is to be strong. Now, the translation, if you want to break this down, this one's kind of a unique part of this little two verses. Um, it actually, in the la original language, it actually means be strengthened. And you're, you may be thinking, David, that's kind of splitting hairs. What's the big deal? Be strong or be strengthened. Um, well, it, it, it actually matters because there is no mandate in Scripture. There's no teaching in the Scripture that says, in of yourself, be strong. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Uh, no, no, no. He, he's, he's saying that there is... This is a passive verb of be strengthened. It matters because you cannot strengthen yourself. This is the work of the Lord in your life. Now, I've tried many times to try to, 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 to change in my life or to grow. If, it, when, if there's areas in my life where I'm struggling, um, I think the best thing we can do is to come to the end of ourselves. And, and sometimes for me, this is a temptation that I have when I'm struggling or in my faith or struggling in the area. I start making a list of things I got to do. I need to read my Bible. I need to go to church. I need to do this. I need to uh, stop doing this, start doing this, stop all this. And, I, and, and those are okay, but I, I can't do it by myself. Those are great outworkings of things. But when the Lord says, hey, I do this in you, you cannot do this of yourself. Those are practical things that are great, but you need to come to me. Your strength, your courage, your ability to overcome has nothing to do with you, David. It has nothing to do with what you can bring to the table. And so I, I, I think, again, I think to 2 Peter chapter 1, where, where in verse 3, where, where Peter says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us the very great and precious promises. So that through them, you may pr participate in the divine nature. Having escaped corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Quickly, I, I love that Peter verse because we have everything we need. It's not, in, it's not in us. This idea of being strengthened, it is coming from an outside source. We cannot do it in of ourselves. This idea of being strong or being strengthened, it is not something that we can just do. But we have everything we need from God the Father. I love how Charles Stanley says this. I got a couple of quotes where God is looking for imperfect men and women who have learned to walk 
in moment by moment dependence on the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit, God himself, who indwells within us, as Stanley says, and I use that quote several times, but God's not looking for people to try to be perfect. He's looking for people who are imperfect at the end of themselves, that they are in desperate dependence on the Holy Spirit, that we as sons and daughters of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, are walking in moment by moment dependence on the Holy Spirit to change us, to strengthen us from the inside out. I don't know about you, but I, I think we all need to answer this question. Would you consider yourself to be walking in moment by moment dependence on the Holy Spirit? If the answer is no, then the question for all of us, including myself, all of us, if we're not doing that, is what are we depending on? In those moments where we need courage, in those moments where we need to be strengthened in, in life or in our faith, what might we be leaning on if it's not on Jesus? Uh, Psalm 73, 26 says that my heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Now, like I said, so often I think Christians try to muster up strength and energy and we neglect where the real power is from, where the strength, real strength comes from. Um, we find our dependence on other things. We lean on those things rather than on the Lord. Uh, one other quote that I love by Francis Chan says this, and I think it's a great declaration. I know, I know it was something that was a de great declaration for me. I pray this for you. It says, I, I want to live so that I'm, I'm truly submitted to the Spirit's leading on my daily basis on daily basis excuse me christ said it's better for us that the spirit came and i want to live like that's true i don't want to keep crawling when i have the ability to fly i i, I hope you heard that because when when chan says that christ said it's better that the spirit's going to come and I want to live like that's true i want to live like i really know and believe that that's true that it's better that the spirit would come and in this last part, we says that, well, I don't want to keep crawling when I have the ability to fly. And for all of us on our spiritual journey, are you crawling in your own strength? Am I crawling in my own strength or am I flying with the strength that the Spirit gives us, or gives me? So because of who God is, we can be ourselves. There's no facades, no games. We don't have to pretend because we are secure and we are strengthened because of who God is, of who Jesus is, and the Spirit that dwells within us. A couple of more scriptures just to, as a reminder of where our strength comes from as we, as we grow. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, wait for the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, 10, Paul speaks to the church in Ephesus. Finally, brothers, be strong in the Lord and mighty in power. Ephesians chapter 3, 16 says, I pray that out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. All of these scriptures are all reminders that the strength that we have comes from an external source. It comes from God himself. But we can be indwelled with the Spirit, and he works from the inside out to help us be strong. It is not a strength from ourselves. It is a strength from the Lord. So the bottom line, God himself uh, strengthens us, and it's a beautiful thing. Last but not least, we've, we've looked at four things. We've seen, number one, that we can be alert, or we need to be alert, excuse me. Number two, to stand firm. Number three, to be courageous in those moments. And number four, to be strengthened. And number five, in verse 14 of our text today, says, Paul says to do everything in love. Uh, I, I, I was fascinated by this, and it's so simple, but it's so complex at the same time. Uh, clearly, this idea of, of doing things in love was an underlying issue from the church. Or for the church in Corinth. Um, a couple of highlights. Back in chapter 1 verse 10. Um, Paul talks about there's divisions. And there's hassles. And there's, there, there's quarreling. Chapter 3 basically he says. Hey one of you says I'm going to follow Paul. I like him better than him. And all these divisions were happening. Chapter 5 there was some perversions with love. And the sexual ethic. They were making it all about them. In chapter 6 they were suing each other. And they had relationship issues. And they hated people. And they, they, just, they were putting people against each other. Chapter 7 they had different struggles in their marriages. Chapter 8, uh, basically, they were taking advantage of, of their weaker brothers and sisters. In chapter 11, they were, uh, I hate this, but I would go back and look at chapter 11. Remember when they did the Lord's Supper and they were gathering all the rich, they were hogging the food, and the poor people couldn't even eat. Uh, they had nothing to come eat, and, and there was no love there. They were not loving. They had an unloving approach to spiritual gifts. They had an unloving approach to everything. And Paul said in verse chapter 13 that if you don't do things in love, it's pointless. Uh, 
And let me hit pause for just a minute. Come back next week because uh, I actually have a, a guest speaker that's going to speak online to us with a video. He's going to actually talk in chapter 13 and go back through that about how we can apply those principles uh, in this uh, pandemic moving forward. Um, so I'm kind of excited. Hope, hope you look forward to that next week. Um, but Paul, today what I want to look at is 1 John chapter 4 is, is a final text. Um, so if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 John 4 if you would. I want you to read this with me as we go. Um, Paul, in this last one, says, do everything with love. This was an issue about loving others, um, and it's, it's kind of basically a summarizing statement. Everything you do, everything, original language, means everything. Everything that you do, do it in love. Look at what John says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Verse 7, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love God, or excuse me, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Uh, so let me hit pause for a second. We're, we're told to love others. We're told where the origin of love is. And basically, if John says if you're born again, if you're born in Christ, we, we've been talking about that. If you're in Christ and not in Adam, then love is a natural overflow of who your identity is in Jesus. And it says if you don't love, then you don't know him. That's a powerful statement here. So from that, from verse 8 to verse 9, we get a powerful depiction of what love really is, of the gospel. Verse 9 says, this is how God showed his love to us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but rather that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, now hear this. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also should love one another. It's so simple, yet it's so profound. Paul is, is pleading with the people in Corinth. You want to summarize everything? Do everything in love. I don't care what it is. I don't care what specific issue or person or problem or work or habit or hobby or things in your life. It doesn't matter. If you can approach it in love and not, not the worldly version of love. we got to make sure we don't take what the world wants to try to define love. But in a selfless love as God does. Did you see? That's exactly what he talked about. God, God loved and gave himself for us. We too should give ourselves and die to ourselves and give ourselves to other people. Now, now hear this. That sounds really great. It sounds really kind of really beautiful. The gospel, the love. and But you know what? On, on the street level, it's very difficult to do. There are people in your life, and just like there's probably in, uh, some in mine, where they're hard to love. <laughs> um, you may be in, in listening to a sermon across from somebody that's hard to love. Parents, sometimes your kids are hard to love. Kids, sometimes parents are hard to love. Relationships, people at church, people in the community, people that you're friends with, people that you're not friends with. There are times when loving people and loving is hard. This is Holy Spirit stuff here. We can't just come up with this casual love people and try to make it sound like it's easy. It is not. It is Holy Spirit stuff. To die to yourself and say, they matter more than me. To put my assumptions and my legalistic viewpoints aside and say, I care more about them than I care about being right. I care more about them and their heart than I care about trying to make a point or to try to sling mud or to be ugly or to, to, to slander someone. Um, on the street level view, this is a difficult task to do. Arguably impossible outside of the Holy Spirit working in us. And that's why Paul says, hey, do it, do it all in love. You can go back to all of those issues in the church. I bet, I know for me, I can go to all of my many issues. And nine times out of ten, I just made that number up by the way. It's about me not loving people. And when I find myself in those areas, it's, it's because I choose myself over them. Um, I think it's, I think it's uh, profound. I think it's simple, but also complex. Um, and this idea of loving people, I, I want to kind of tie this up. I was, I was reminded about many, 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 many years ago when I was in college, and, and uh, before I graduated, I worked for a summer at a camp called Canacook. Um, and long story short, the, 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 it, was a, it was a summer camp where kids would come, and I would be a counselor to them, and uh, we, we, we lived in a cabin, and they did their sports, and I was a coach to them, but also um, I was like a camp counselor to, to them for two weeks uh, up to a month. Um, and we had an awesome time, but the camp had a thing. 
the theme of the camp was I'm third. Heard it when I first got there, didn't know what it meant, but it's something that profoundly changed me and it still changed me. Uh, it's been a, it's, it was actually the theme of my youth ministry. It's been the kind of hopefully the theme of my heart of what I want to live and how I want to be. It, what it is, it goes back to this original premise of putting God first, putting others second, and I'm third. Uh, it goes back to Jesus' teaching in Matthew 22. Um, when the Pharisees tried to trick Jesus and they're saying, of all of these teachings, of all the laws, Jesus, what's the most important one? And Jesus replied and he said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second, I tell you, is this, love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and the prophets hang on these two things. And for me, that was a paradigm change for me because uh, that was it. That was what I thought in ministry or in life or working with students or working with adults or as a pastor. For me, that's kind of been the, the, the banner, if you will. If I can do those two things, and I like it when things are stripped down to the basics. If I, I, I love God first, I love others, and that puts me third. And if I can use those two words, those two reminders of saying, am I being third? I'm third, I'm third. You matter more than me. This, this, uh, this is not a big deal. I'm choosing to, to love, filled with the Spirit, to love others. It's a powerful, powerful reminder. So I, I pray that maybe you can write that I'm third down, those two words. Maybe it'll be good for you. Uh, write it on your mirror. Write it in your Bible. Write it on a note card. Write it somewhere. I just want that to be a reminder for you to say, if we're loving well, if we're loving biblically, if we're doing everything in love, then that's our place. God's first. Others are second, and we are third. I want to challenge you that. We, we often fail. I fail. And let me give you, as I, as I kind of wrap this up, um, let me give you an example from a failure of mine, which I have many. Um, well, we don't love well. And it's something even the smallest things can do that. Um, we were going for a walk. I know many of us in this, you know, when we're quarantined at home, uh, if the weather's nice, everybody goes out to ride bikes and to walk and do stuff. And we were going for a walk the other day, and um, I... Uh, we were walking by the school, and we were coming around, and somebody, I, didn't, I honestly don't know who it was, they were coming, and they're riding their bike, and they had a mask on outside. You know, there's lots of people wearing masks at stores and doing things with the pandemic and, and trying to be safe. And, um, and I said something to my wife, and she had to call me on it, and I didn't, it, it sounded innocent, it sounded real, but it was kind of ugly in my heart. And I literally, I kind of said something to her, I said, it's weird how outside, that's the one place where you don't really need a mask. I mean, she... She's wearing one on her bike right around town. It's kind of weird. And she turned to me and she said, it matters to her. And I went, man, guys, don't you hate it when your wife's right uh, uh, or, or somebody calls you on something? And it convicted me because what I had just done in that simple moment, I was not loving. I put my legalistic mindset on them. What I thought was kind of silly, um, she didn't. And it's something as simple as that is a reminder where we don't love people well. Um, man, I've been at the grocery store a couple of times, and I put I wear gloves, and I put a mask on at the store. Uh, if I go to Walmart or the grocery store, and you know what? I've, I've had people look at me. But it's amazing when I'm the one, people looking at me, I feel okay with what I'm doing. But isn't it just like that, those moments where we have turned it, and we've, in our viewpoint, in our mindset, we have determined our rightness in become legalistic in that and we are judgmental and we don't really understand why she's doing that. Um, wearing the mask outside on your bicycle, why would you? I wasn't loving well. I was convicted of that and I was appreciative. I wasn't at the time, I was kind of convicted about it. Um, but isn't that a good example of how if we're not careful, we can just make it about us and not love? That wasn't very I'm third. That was just kind of being judgmental and not loving. But hear me friends as I close. We are in a world where things are beginning to change, whether it be going back to church, decisions that were going to be made, and it's very, very easy to start looking around and starting to choose sides and starting to blame and starting to do these things, um, to make assessments or judgments about things, um, and just bit by bit, we can do things in an unloving way, just like I did. And so I just want to challenge you with that, of just be on third. Um, be cautious of, of, of the things that come across your path and the judgments and the things that, 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 that come our way um, because it's so easy, um, even in the littlest things, to not love people well. Um, I didn't, so maybe you could learn from my failure in those moments. Um, so as a church, um, it's, it's, 
it's simple today, these five points. Um, Church, that we would be on our, on our guard, that we would be aware, that we would be alert, that we would stand firm on our faith, that we would be courageous, that we would be strengthened, and that we would do everything in love. And so what I want to leave you with is, and I'm going to pray and we're going to wrap up, is I would like for you as your family, whoever you're listening to, simply and quickly, whatever's best for you, just walk through those five things. Talk about each one of them, each discussion, and then when you're done, just pray that we would live in a manner um, that is, is worthy of the gospel, live in a worthy manner of the scriptures, and that we would do those things, uh, that we might not fall into the traps of that of Corinth, but we can live the way that God wants us to in this life-changing message of the gospel. So thank you for joining us. Let me pray for us, uh, and then you can discuss those five things with your family. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this time together. And uh, God, I pray that we can all uh, begin to live this message out. Uh, live out the scriptures, that we can do what you've asked us to do. And I pray that these five principles would be a hallmark of our life, that we can put ourselves against them as a church collectively and as individual followers of Jesus. Help us to live in a manner worthy of the gospel in a way that you see fitting, Lord. Bless this time of discussion, and we ask it all in the great name of Jesus.